event. This is our second annual event. We are very excited to host it here at Iowa State. The Women in Data Science Initiative aims to inspire and educate data scientists worldwide, regardless of gender, and to support women in the field. WITS started as a one-day technical conference at Stanford in two, November 2015. Five years later, WITS is a global movement that includes a number of worldwide initiatives. WITS Ames is an independent event that, organ, that is organized by Iowa State University WITS Ambassadors as part of the annual WITS Worldwide Conference organiz, organized by Stanford University with an estimated 200 plus locations worldwide, which features outstanding women doing outstanding work in the field of data science. This event today is supported in part by the Department of Computer Science, the HDR Tripods D4 Dependable Data Driven Discovery Institute, and CSAFE, Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence. Next is Zara Koshmanish to introduce our first speaker. Hello everyone. It is our great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Alicia Kerikori. Dr. Kerikori is Distinguished Professor and President's Chair in Statistics at Iowa State University and Director of the Center for Statistics and Application in Forensic Evidence, CSAFE, a federally funded research center. Dr. Kerikori was an invited speaker at WITS Stanford 2019 and provided an overview of CSAFE research on bullet land to topography, explaining different methods to determine whether a suspect is the source of evidence left at a crime scene. Her recent research interests include the statistical learning algorithms and their application in various disciplines in particular in forensic science and criminal justice. Today, Dr. Kerikweri will talk about machine learning in the evaluation of forensic evidence. Let's welcome Dr. Alicia Kerikweri. Thank you so very much. <clears throat> I really appreciate the wonderful introduction uh, and the invitation. And uh, let me see, oh yeah, I can share my screen. So yeah. let me without any further ado, start sharing. So um, let's see, can you see my screen? I'm gonna move to full screen mode. You can see my screen, right? Looks good. Excellent. So um, feel free to interrupt me and, uh, or if you have questions or what have you, let's see, I need to make sure that I don't go over time as is my usual custom. Uh, and uh, what I want to do today is, first of all, congratulations on, on the second uh, year that WITS is being hosted at Iowa State. This is really great. Um, yeah, I'm all for it. And what I want to do today is rather than give a technical talk, I want to um, talk about the applications and how much work there is still to do, for example, in the criminal justice uh, system. So um, I have to say that uh, no, all of the work that we do and uh, many of the things that we'll present today uh, is the collective work of a lot of wonderful colleagues, staff and students in the Center for Statistics and Applications in Forensic Evidence here in uh, Iowa State. This is a, the center is funded by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Um, and we are really a consortium of six universities, uh, University of California in Irvine, Carnegie Mellon, uh, Duke, Iowa State is a lead institution, uh, University of Virginia and West Virginia University. And we have three affiliated institutions, uh, Nebraska Lincoln, uh, University of Pennsylvania and Swarthmore College. So this is, we are a big uh, center. And the work that I'll talk about today is, um, much of it is Professor Heike Hoffmans, who's the director of the uh, data science program at Iowa State and uh, Susan Vanderplas, a former colleague of ours, who's now in um, Nebraska. 
And of course, a lot of talented graduate students and undergraduate students that work with us. So um, I would like for you to meet Mr. Keith Allen Harward. So Mr. Harward uh, is 59 years old currently, and he was freed. Uh, he came out of prison in 2016. He spent 33 years uh, in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Uh, he was convicted on one piece of evidence, which was a bite mark found on one of the victim's legs. A woman was murdered, and the person that murdered her bit, no, not murdered, uh, sexually assaulted her. And the, and the woman and the, and the assailant uh, bit her on the leg. So um, this is the crime. So she was attacked in her home in Newport News in Virginia. Um, she was sexually assaulted and the, uh, and the attacker also bit her in the leg. And so she testified that it had been, the assailant was a clean uh, uh, shaven man in a sailor's uniform. And the thing is that Newport News is home of a humongous Navy uh, base, naval base. And so there's a lot of uh, uh, sailors milling about town usually. So in fact, Mr. Harward was a sailor. He was stationed on the USS Vinson uh, in the shipyard and uh, every sailor in the ship was asked to provide a dentition mold. Uh, Mr. Harward uh, provided one and he was excluded as the biter. But it turns out that a few months later, he, Mr. Harward had a fight with his girlfriend in the fight, he happened to bite her hand. And so he ended up in court. Uh, and uh, the prosecutor got a hold of this, brought the victim in to identify Mr. Harwood. She said he was not the person that had attacked her. This didn't deter the authorities. What they did is they uh, put a guard under hypnosis in the shipyard. And under hypnosis, this guard claimed that on the day of the murder, of the day of the attack, he had seen um, Mr. Howard come back into the yard with a bloody uniform. So a forensic odontologist testified in the trial that with reasonable scientific certainty, whatever that may mean, uh, Mr. Howard's dentition matched the bite mark of the victim. And another one stated that nobody else in this universe, universe could have made that mark except Mr. Howard. So he was convicted to uh, life in prison. And until he was, you know, and, you know, he kept insisting he was innocent. And 33 years later, finally, uh, was freed on a new DNA analysis that showed that he was not the culprit. So he, and it was the Innocence Project, by the way, that uh, took on his case. Bite mark analysis is what we might call junk science. Um, forensic odontologists claim uh, to be able to tell uh, which person uh, bit somebody. The truth of the story is that the one and only study that has been done in uh, the United States, anywhere in the world actually, uh, has shown that forensic odontologists cannot even tell whether some abrasion injury is a bite mark at all, let alone tell which particular person could have uh, made that mark. And so um, the problem is uh, precedent in the, in the US courts, precedent is very powerful. And so this kind of horrible unscientific evidence keeps getting introduced and admitted into court simply because it was admitted earlier in some earlier cases. And so, where is the science in forensic science? And this is one of the things uh, we, I want to talk about today. So what I'll talk about uh, for the next several minutes is uh, the forensic question. So what is it that forensic sciences are typically charged with doing? Um, the type of data we work with here in CSAFE, it's called pattern evidence, and it's pretty challenging and you'll see why. And then uh, what we have been doing, I. I I should have picked a different example. I picked again the striations on bullets because that's a good example. And we have made a lot of progress in that area and the, the, the lot of uh, the work that is still ahead of us. All right, so the question of source. So 
suppose that a crime is committed and there's some evidence that may be found at the crime scene. And the evidence can be anything. It could be some biological sample like you know blood or saliva or semen. It can be a spent bullet. It could be uh, hairs. It can be whatever. Um, and the question that uh, forensic scientists ask is, could the suspect or, or the defendant uh, be the source of the evidence we found at the crime scene? And so can we place the suspect at the crime scene? And so the approach is to compare the crime scene evidence with an item obtained from the suspect. So, you know, the latent print you found at the crime scene with a reference print you get from the suspect's finger or a, a spent cartridge case in the, in the, from the um, crime scene against a reference shot obtained using the gun that the defendant owns. And then uh, if the two items are similar enough, then the suspect cannot be excluded as a source of the evidence. But the question is, what do we mean by similar enough? And this is where, uh, this is where things go off the rails, oftentimes in forensic science or in the practice of forensics, because by uh, similar enough, uh, most of the times we mean, trust me, I've looked at a lot of evidence and I can tell you that these two things are very similar. And um, so ideally what you would want is, uh, you know, in order to explore this question of source, um, you would like to be able to do two things. The first thing you would like to be able to do is quantify the similarity between those two items you're trying to compare. And then if you find that those two items are indistinguishable in some way, then the next step you want to uh, do is figure out whether that degree of similarity you just observed is significant. So if I tell you that a crime was committed on the campus of Iowa State and the assailant was seen running away with a t-shirt that said Iowa State University, then that's not very significant because everybody and their mother is wearing a t-shirt that says Iowa State University. Uh, and so even though, um, you know, the t-shirt of your suspect might match what the witnesses saw. Anybody else, there, there's a lot of people that would have matched too if you had uh, looked a little further. And so we say that evidence is probative when a high degree of similarity uh, can, between uh, two items can only be observed among items that have the same source. So DNA, for example, if you have a DNA match, that's highly probative because we know that with the exception of twins, no two people uh, share the same DNA. Blood type on the other hand is not probative at all because lots of different people share the same blood type. And the truth of the story is that except for DNA and blood type, we don't have any idea what the probative value of any other type of evidence might be. So we don't really know whether fingerprints are unique. We don't, re and in particular, we, you know, when you see a latent print at a crime scene, all smudgy, we don't really know how many prints, nice reference prints might be indistinguishable from that smudgy print we find at the crime scene. And so we don't know. Now, the type of uh, data that we work with here in CSAFE is what's called, well, we work with digital evidence, but we also work with uh, what's called pattern evidence. And pattern evidence is probably one of the most challenging areas in forensic science, because the data you have to work with uh, is typically something like what I'm showing here on the right, uh, where I'm showing you a smudgy uh, print, you know, partially observed uh, print of a shoe on something, maybe dust or what have you, that was found at the crime scene. And the question is, if I look at the nice print to the right of it, that's a suspect's print, can I say that it was this particular shoe and no other shoe, this particular shoe that left this print at the crime scene? And you can see, and the same is true for fingerprints, for striations on bullets, for essentially for anything that we can represent using a two-dimensional or a three-dimensional image. 
of the question and the reference impressions. And so the data that we have to work with is uh, images, thousands of pixels. We know their coordinates, we know their intensities. And um, this is, and, and you know, we have two images and then the question is, are these images similar enough for me to conclude that maybe uh, this item was what made this particular impression? This is a very high dimensional problem and uh, it's very difficult to write a standard statistical model or a traditional statistical model. So what we use is a lot of uh, algorithms, machine learning algorithms. And one thing I should say is that, um, and it's important for us, is that uh, what we try to use algorithms that are semi-transparent um, in the sense that they are easier to explain to individuals. So obviously a convolutional neural net is probably more powerful than a random forest, but a random forest is a whole lot easier to explain to a lay person than a convolutional neural net. And it's, you know, you get, it's, it's much easier to see what's going on behind a random forest than a convolutional neural net. So that's one of the things that guides our choice of methods. So very quickly, um, let me talk a little bit about the case of uh, striations on bullets. So um, I imagine that most of you guys don't know a thing about bullets and uh, that's great. I didn't know anything about bullets <laughs> until we started working on this, uh, on this type of data. So this is ammunition that I'm showing you on the left and ammunition is composed of different pieces. So the silver piece here is the cartridge case. And inside this cartridge case, towards the bottom here, there's gunpowder and there's um, other stuff. Uh, and this when, and then the, the tip here, what I'm showing you that in this case is copper, uh, uh, copper covered. This is what the bullet is. And so when you fire a gun, what happens is there's a firing pin in the gun. It hits the, cart the bottom of the cartridge case right here. There's an explosion that occurs inside the cartridge case and uh, the bullet is ejected with a lot of force. The cartridge case just falls to the side and the bullet then travels uh, down the barrel of the gun, which I'm showing you over here. And this grooves in the barrel of the gun here that are at a slant, these uh, grooves impart rotation to the bullet as it goes uh, along, as it moves down the barrel. And this rotation is so that the bullet will be more stable in flight. So the thing is that you have, um, and so what happens is that uh, these, uh, these pieces, so there's imperfections in this, in, in, uh, inside, uh, inside these barrels. And what happens is that when the bullet travels down, not only do you get this groove marks on the bullets, you also get um, engraved imperfections. And this is what the firearms examiners look at, the imperfections that impart this triad that I am showing you here. So this copper looking uh, figure on the right here, this is, this is the bottom of the bullet. This would be the top. And this is just one of the sections, one of the sections in the circumference of the bullet that I'm looking at. It's called a land. And um, so this is a land of, uh, this is a piece of a bullet and you can imagine the, we've, the, the forensic scientist may recover a bullet from a dead person, for example, and compare that bullet to a bullet that was shot from the um, suspect's gun. And so uh, at the moment, the state of the art is to do this comparison using what's called a, uh, a comparison microscope. And so this a comparison microscope is nothing but two optical microscopes that are coupled together. And so you can see one sample on one side, the other sample on the other side, and you can fiddle with the samples until you, you, know, you can align them. And this is what, it, what a, an examiner might see. One a question bullet on the left, let's say, and the reference bullet on the right. And then this red line separates both of them and they fiddle until they find, you know, like a striation here that cuts across 
and maybe there's another striation, so like here, for example, that cuts across. And after they look at this, they go, these two bullets were fired from the same gun. And uh, how do you know? It's my expert opinion. And so there is no agreement in terms of there has to be this many matching striations or, you know, there has to be no more than blah, non-matching striations, nothing. Uh, it's a purely subjective assessment. So what we decided was that perhaps we could do better. And so uh, at Iowa State here, we now have several uh, high resolution um, instruments that allow us to get images of the surface topography of these bullets, of these lands. And this one is, this was uh, obtained with a confocal uh, microscope. Uh, we have a couple of those, but now we've been uh, obtaining different types of instruments that look, that get different 3D impressions of these bullets. This is the bottom uh, towards the top. This would be the top. And here's one of those groove marks and here's the other groove mark. And so what an examiner looks at is this area over here. And so um, if we look at this, uh, so what I have up here on the top is that same bullet land that I showed you, but tilted. Now I'm looking at it uh, in this direction. And here's one of those groove areas. Here's another one of those groove areas. And what I'm interested in is this stuff in the middle. And uh, the middle figure here is a single pixel representation of this image over here. And there's a lot of pre-processing that we do with this data. We uh, cut off the groove area. Um, and I don't have it over here. Uh, okay. And so you can see that the dominant structure here is a curvature. And all bullet lands have the same curvature or similar curvature. So that's not interesting because it doesn't allow us to compare anything. What's interesting is the deviations from the curvature, like this little peak here and these peaks over here and so on. And so those are the striations themselves. Those are those micro striations that carry information about the gun that fired the bullet. And so what we do here is we fit a statistical model, a non-parametric model, it's called a um, local uh, regression model. Uh, that follows that follows this curvature and then extract the residuals from that model. And the residuals from that model are those striations themselves. And so this is what you see down at the bottom. This is uh, the length of the land the, in the x-axis. So here would be one shoulder, here would be the other one. Here is zero. So this would be the, the, the surface, if you will, of the land. And the tops and the, the peaks and the valleys of the striations are what I'm showing you. We call this the signature of a land. Now, of course, if I have two lands to compare from two different bullets, here's one signature, here's the other signature, I can align those two things and uh, overlay them. And this is the best alignment we have of those two signatures. And once you have this, you're, uh, you know, you're happy as a clam because suddenly you can start extracting data. And so for example, uh, we can look at these two overlaying signatures and compute things such as the number of matches and mismatches in the peaks and the valleys, the number of consecutive matches and mismatches, the difference in the depth of the peaks and the valleys, the area between the signatures, cross correlations, you name it. There's any number of features we can extract from this. And once we have features, we can um, quantify similarity. So um, it turns out that none of these features. So, so here's the story. Imagine you have a lot of, you have a training data set. So you have a lot of pairs of these bullet lands that you know were fired from the same gun. And you also have a lot of pairs of this bullet lands that you know were fired from different guns. So you have two labels here, same gun, different gun, and you have a training data set that includes items in the, that with both labels. And so you can train a random forest, for example, to look at all these features and combine them into some sort of a similarity score. And ideally, you would want to have a similarity score 
that takes on high values among pairs of bullets that were fired from the same gun and takes on low values among pairs of bullets that were fired from different guns. And so if you have that, then maybe when you present this random forest with that new pair of bullets, the random forest will be able to classify it correctly as same gun or different gun. So the algorithm that we propose results in a score that takes on values between zero and one. And so uh, we, we can actually interpret these values as empirical probabilities. So what we're doing is we're estimating the probability of same gun uh, versus the probability of different guns. And so um, we trained this random forest. Um, we had a, in the training data set that we originally started with, now we have a much bigger training set. But originally we started with a relatively number, a relatively modest number of pairs of bullets uh, that we knew were fired from different and from the same gun. And um, the algorithm did fantastic. But of course, algorithms tend to do fantastic with their training data sets. And so the question is, what would happen if you present the algorithm with new data? In other words, with new pairs of bullets. So we issued a challenge to various police departments around the country, and they were only too happy to send us their bullets without telling us which ones were fired from which gun. And so what we got from them was, for example, I'll show you one set that we got from the Phoenix Police Department. This was a data set. This set included uh, three test shots that we knew were fired from each of eight guns. So we had three sets of test shots, uh, sorry, eight sets of three test shots each. We knew that those uh, bullets match each other and were match a specific barrel. And then they sent us 10 question bullets and they didn't tell us where those came from. And they said, and this was an open set, which is the toughest type of set because some of these question bullets may not have been fired by any of the eight guns. And some of the guns in the test set may not have fired any of the question bullets. So it's not like we could buy, you know, start discarding. Um, and so these were the results from that Phoenix study. Each column here represents a gun. And so gun A9, gun C8, gun F6, and so on. And each row here represents a question bullet. So there's 10 rows. And so for example, we found uh, and the orange here means high random forest core, and the gray means very low random forest core. And so we looked at bullet N, and we found that it looked like it matched all three of the reference bullets from uh, barrel A9 and didn't match any of the other reference bullets. And B seemed to match the shots from C8 and nothing else. And E seemed to match the shots of F6 and nothing else. There was nothing that question bullets Q, Y, and Z appeared to match. So, you know, no orange here. And uh, there was nothing that matched the, the three shots from barrel U10. So we submitted these results. And it turns out they were all correct. So this, the firearms examiners in the Phoenix Police Department were very surprised that you know a bunch of statisticians would be able to tell them uh, do ballistics examination essentially. We tried this in many different data sets, and it seems that uh, these things do work pretty well. And the question is, OK, so we can, we can quantify similarity. The question is, how do we address the, the issue of probative value? And so um, it seems, well, first of all, it seems that we can move away from the subjective assessments. Trust me, these two bullets look very similar there, for they were fired from the same gun. That's a good thing. <laughs> but then uh, what does what? What does it follow? Uh, does it mean that they in fact have a common source, two bullets that are similar? And you could have two similar bullets that originate from different sources. And the probability of this happening is what's called the, the probability of a coincidental match. 
uh, this or random match probability, sometimes you hear this uh, mentioned as. And so what we would like, as I said, initially to have is an algorithm that can tell apart very with very low false positives and very low false negative rate when a bullet is fired, when two bullets are fired from the same gun or not. And so this is the same data set that I showed you. And so what we're looking here is at two distributions of these random forest cores uh, obtained from this Phoenix data set. The orange distribution here are the scores that we obtained for pairs that we knew came from the same gun. The gray distribution here corresponds to this, the range of scores that we observed for bullets that we knew were fired from different guns. So this, forget this, um, these vertical lines. So this is, uh, if you, we want to classify, if we want to make a decision, we have to have a threshold that says, for scores above blah, declare same gun. For scores below blah, declare different gun. And there's many different ways of coming up with those thresholds. And these were three different ways we used to see whether there would be a good threshold in this particular case. And so, um, and so this is what uh, we're trying now. In fact, uh, yesterday, Heike and I, the day before yesterday and yesterday, we had a meeting with a bunch of firearms examiners in the state of Virginia to talk about these approaches and to talk about these algorithms and uh, things are moving forward. I expect to see this type of approaches in labs, in crime labs in the United States within the next maybe two or three years. And so things are changing rapidly. Uh, we're doing a lot of other work. Um, so we're using in CSAFE convolutional neural nets, for example, to recognize pattern elements in the outsoles of shoes, uh, like lines or zigzags or circles or what have you, um, to look at different areas on a bullet land and be able to tell, you know, have this automatic way to tell the algorithm, ignore this piece of the land because it's damaged or this is break off, you can ignore this too, or this is the striations you need to be looking at. So uh, during the pandemic, my colleague Heike Hoffman had an army of undergraduates by hand labeling lands, I mean, on the computer, so that we could set, uh, have a, a training data set. Uh, Siamese con uh, con um, convolutional neural nets were used to quantify similarity between uh, lines of handwritten text in uh, two different documents. So this is for handwriting analysis. And as I said earlier, simpler methods. So we, uh, you know, these methods can be very uh, powerful, but they're very hard to explain to non-experts. And so we, if we have two methods that perform more or less the same, we tend to go towards a simpler method because it's easier to explain. We continue to use a lot of boring statistical analysis in many cases, so that's not uh, definitely not out of the question any, uh, these days. And we build a lot of databases for developing training, testing, and validating the algorithms we propose, because in the area of forensic science, data is very, very, very scarce. And so this is one of the areas that we spend a lot of resources on building databases that we put in the public domain for others to um, develop their own methodology. The need for fair administration of justice um, is there. And uh, the need for scientists that will work in this area has not abated at all. Uh, the, I hope that the message that I convey to you is that the work we do as quantitative scientists can have a tremendous impact. In this particular area, we can reduce the number of wrongfully convicted individuals. Aha, uh, I got my two minute warning. <laughs> and, uh, you know, banish ad hoc pseudo junkie science methods. Uh, in, from the courts and minimize subjectivity in forensic assessments. We're always looking for new talent at CSAFE. 
And so if you're on campus and would like to participate in the work we do, please get in touch. This is our website and uh, this is my name and you know where to find me and I'd love to hear from you. And that is all I have to say today. And the staff here is very surprised that I didn't go over time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kaikuri. It was an interesting talk. And now it's time for question and answer. I will ask one of our ambassadors, Javad, to ask question from Dr. Kaikuri. Oh, so here's some, um, actually, you know what? There's some questions in the Q&A. Is that what I'm supposed to look at? Uh, yes, Dr. Kaikuri. Okay. Uh, one question is that how do you align the two samples to compare? That's a good question. So what essentially what we do is we look at cross correlations and we find, uh, so we simply move one on top of the other until we find, we maximize the cross correlation between the two signatures. So it's not hard. Great. Uh, the next question is, is that how do you decide what model to use in terms of the complexity and explainability? Yes, that's another very good question. So um, we work with forensic scientists and with lawyers. Now, if you've ever spoken to a lawyer, they will say, I studied law because I hate science or I was bad in math. And so, you know, you've mentioned a convolutional neural net to somebody in law and their, you know, their eyes glaze over. And it's very difficult for them to be able to explain this to a lay juror and, you know, to be comfortable explaining it themselves. So simplicity is always uh, very important to us. Uh, be able to explain this in terms that people can understand. Of course, if the performance is vastly superior uh, when you apply some other more complicated approach, then there's no question that you have to go with a more complicated approach. But if you can get away with something that's simple and gives you a reasonable answer, that's what we do. Okay. Uh, the next question is that, uh, could you explain a little on your choose of random forest modeling uh, versus uh, any of the popular tree-based algorithm out there like XGBoost, CutBoost, Nextro? CutBoost, I don't know that I know CutBoost to be honest with you. I am, um, the random forest is a very, um, it's a very nice uh, algorithm from a statistical point of view. Uh, you have, uh, you can, oh, there we go. But you can hardly handle categorical variables. Oh, I see. Interesting. So I'm sure there's better approaches than a random forest. I mean, that the, we are not married to a random forest. We're just, uh, we just like these tree algorithm, tree-based algorithms because they are uh, pretty intuitive. So, and you can actually write down what you're doing and, uh, and explain it to somebody. We are an R shop here in uh, CSAFE. And so many of these other approaches, um, uh, Python products, uh, not that we don't use Python, we do, but uh, being statisticians, we started with R and that's, uh, and, and R has some very nice uh, functions to fit trees, uh, to fit random forests. It seems that, oh, Dan. It seems that there are many options for building the non-match part. Oh yeah, that's a good one, yeah. Okay, so this is an excellent question. What do we mean by non-matching pairs? And the, in the case of guns and ammunition, uh, we still don't know what a close non-match would be. Ideally, what you want to be able to tell, to have an algorithm that can tell apart close non-matches, right? If I'm a forensic scientist and I find a footprint at a crime scene and the footprint from the crime scene seems to be size six, 
and then I have a suspect who shows a size 13. Well, that's not a close non match, and any algorithm should be able to tell that those, those, you know, an impression from those two impressions would not match. And so the question is, how do you define the population of close non matches? And in firearms, we still don't know what that means. Uh, do we have to have, do we have to respect the, in the, in the case of firearms so far, what we have done is get a bunch of guns of the same make and model and, um, you know, get a lot of uh, shots from those uh, same make and model guns with the same type of ammunition and, come and create those pairs, uh, you know, the, uh, so let's say I have 15 Ruger uh, guns, nine millimeters, I would, why would create a non-matching pair by comparing a bullet from gun one with a bullet from gun two? Now, could we expand that and include other types of gun in the same non-matching population? We don't know that. And so right now it's all pretty close non-matches. And in fact, in some of the studies that we work with, um, people try to buy guns that are consecutively manufactured. So, uh, you know, one after the other coming out of the assembly line, so that if there is a defect, for example, a manufacturing defect, you would tend to see the same defect in all the barrels that go down the line at the same time. And that would, in principle, make the comparisons even more challenging. Uh, okay, uh, thanks all. Uh, our time is uh, up. Uh, I also thank uh, Professor Caligari for interesting presentation. Uh, and also I want to uh, say thank uh, all of you for uh, their questions. Uh, now Zahra introduced a new presenter. Let me get out of here. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. Our next speaker is Dr. Guiping Ho. Dr. Guiping Ho is an associate professor in the Department of Industrial and Manufacturing System at Iowa State University. Her research has focused on operations research and data analytics with applications in renewable energy systems, supply chain design, and bioinformatics and sustainable agriculture. Dr. Hu's research has been supported by NSF, USDA, DOE, and DOD. She has published over 100 journal papers or conference proceedings. Today, Dr. Hu talks about machine learning and applications in agriculture productions. Let's welcome Dr. Hu. Well, thank you. Let me share my screen. Sure. Can you see it? Can you can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, yes. perfect. Yes. Perfect. Okay. Well, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. When I got the invitation, I got the instruction to stay at high level and try to talk to the audience in terms of how and why I arrived at my career stage. And you'll see uh, a little bit of my background in some of the slides. But in terms of the research topic, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of the applications, uh, again, at very high level machine learning and applications in agricultural production. I know Caroline is right after me in the talk. So I'm sure he'll talk, she'll talk about some of her work in the genetics as well. Um, but I'm personally very interested in how we uh, best improve the efficiency in the agricultural sector, which is a very important sector and which is what Iowa State is actually known for in a lot of areas. Um, so a little bit about my background so that we can relate better and um, feel free to ask any question about research as well as my uh, career um, stage, how I, how I arrived at data science. So my training, my undergraduate was actually in mechanical engineering in automation, but I had a dual degree in management science. Uh, 
When I came to the United States to do my um, uh, master and PhD in University of Pittsburgh, I did industrial engineering, sort of a marriage of uh, mechanical engineering and management science. And after I joined Iowa State in 2009, I started as a lecturer, mainly focused on teaching. And then later on, I thought oh, a very interesting research. So I started talking to all kinds of people on campus. And actually, before I start my tenure check in 2011, I was doing some uh, independent research actually in the agricultural area because Iowa State is very much known for that area. Anyway, so I've gone through the um, assistant and now I'm associate professor, but in addition to industrial and manufacturing systems engineering, I'm also affiliated with a graduate program for uh, sustainable agriculture and bioeconomy institute, uh, which I've done quite a bit work in the biofuel area uh, related to life cycle assessment and uh, techno economic analysis. And I'm also affiliated with BCB, Bioinformatics and Computational Biology, uh, which is a program that's focusing on using computational tool to improve uh, the informatics in the biology area and broadly finally to improve the production system. So um, I've thrown one slide here to talk about my teaching interest because I think some of them is actually related to data science and maybe down the road, if you're interested, you can take some of those to the, let me just see if I can get the pointer out. So the top three are some graduate level courses. Um, I teach uh, big data analytics and optimization in which I'll talk about all kinds of uh, predictive type of models. And then mock of decision process uh, processes is a uh, OR course that focuses on decision-making, um, sequential decision-making. So when you make a decision, it's actually impact your future decisions as well. So think about our career decision, right? When you decide to join Iowa State, it actually impact some of your future decision as well. So how did you decide uh, what kind of decision to make uh, given the information we have? And then this semester, I'm actually teaching a class called production scheduling. So uh, this is more traditional OR course. We're talking about how we improve efficiency on the shop floor. Um, the, these are some uh, undergraduate level course optimization, engineering economic analysis, and engineering problem solving. And one slide on my research. So my uh, research is broader than agricultural, but today I'll mainly focus on some project uh, on machine learning and data science in agricultural. So my research is in the general area of operations research. And some people may be wondering, so what's operations research, right? So operations research is basically a discipline try to improve efficiency with uh, mathematic modeling. So we're trying to provide quantitative support, say, well, this is a production system. How do we model that so that we can provide quantitative support, say, if you change this decision, it's going to impact this type of outcome. And then some of the application uh, include supply chain management, um, of course, big data analytics, and also um, a few of my projects has to do with plant breeding, which I'll allude a little bit later in my specific project, and sustainable agriculture and renewable energy. Um, I've worked uh, uh, quite a bit on that as well. So I want to include my one slide of uh, acknowledgement, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, a lot of this project, uh, we've, uh, we're very, um, fortunate to receive support to support the student um, on this type of project. So in terms of data analytics and optimization in the um, agricultural area, my research are mainly focusing on using genotype and also environment information to basically make vector prediction or decision making related to phenotype. In this case, phenotype can be certain type of trait, like for example, job resistance or disease resistance, or a common one, maybe you are trying to improve yield. And in this process, there is a very important component that's management. And management is especially important and relevant when we are talking about decision making and data science. So there are three levels of uh, data science here. The first level is called descriptive. So when we have historic data, we're trying to understand what happened, right? We're trying to describe what happened. And then the next stage is called predictive. 
which means given historic data, and we are trying to predict if this thing were to happen, what kind of outcome would this uh, get? For example, when we grow this type of seed in this new environment or in this new location, what kind of yield will we get at the end of the season? And then the last is is called prescriptive. And this is where I think decision-making and data science can really shine. Because after you understand what happened and what's going to happen, now what's really important is for you to think about what can we do to make it better, right? So ultimately, decision-making is really where the impact that can come. And I'm going to use the next probably six, seven slides to talk about a few projects that, um, uh, that I've done or a lot of my PhD students have done over the uh, last few years. The first one is called yield prediction. And for this specific study, we were using machine learning. And in addition to using machine learning, we're using something called simulation crop modeling. And what we did was we are combining machine learning and simulation crop model to improve the yield prediction. So some of the pros and cons are listed here in each of the boxes. So for example, crop modeling is trying to simulate how the crop grows, but uh, it tends to require a lot of data calibration as well as the computational time is very long. For machine learning, we know that it has some merit in terms of dealing with data, but the transparency tend to be low. And sometimes we can improve uh, the performance and it's, uh, it's uh, very nicely prediction accuracy, but we cannot explain it. So what we are doing here is combine sort of the merits of these two methods and try to address the shortcomings of the other. And we provide um, what's called a hybrid model. And in this case, we'll actually be able to improve the prediction accuracy as well as maintaining some of the transparency and explainability in the um, prediction process. And in this hybrid prediction uh, model, so first to the, in the training data, we have yield, weather, soil, and model management data. So management data would include um, how, what kind of seed and uh, what kind of plant population as well as what kind of management practice throughout the season. And we have weather information as well as soil information. Now, parallelly, we have machine learning on the top and then crop modeling on the bottom. And what we are doing is taking some of the intermediate uh, crop modeling output, for example, well the, um, uh, when the um, plant is going to flower, and then what kind of biomass it can generate at a specific stage of the crop. And also some water stress prediction given the weather information. And given this information, we incorporate that into the machine learning as part of the feature space. And by doing that, we can actually um, combine that to have an integrated yield prediction um, framework. So that's the yield prediction. The next one is sort of uh, um, connected. Um, so this is um, G by E by M. G stands for genotype, E stands for in environment, and M stands for management. And in this study, we were using a public database and one of my PhD students designed an algorithm called evolutionary neural network. So what that is, it's basically a neural network and we are combining some evolutionary algorithm to improve this training process. And by doing that, we can speed up the, uh, the training process as well as improving the prediction accuracy. And each of those, if you want to know more information, we have a uh, you know, paper published and I'll, I'll be able to share offline. Um, but given the time I'm allocated, I just want to give a flavor because I know the purpose of this symposium or this meeting is really get uh, our student or participant exposed to a variety of applications. And then the next one is um, actually um, Saba, who is one of the ambassadors in this, in this team. This is her research project that's to do with genomic selection and mating strategy. So genomic selection is a technique that uses genetic information to help the breeding process. And so traditionally, you think about uh, 
for the for the people who are not in the agricultural area, think about when we are trying to um, breed or produce superior corn. Let's say we want to um, produce a high yielding corn. Historically, the way we do that is we we were trying to look at phenotypical you know, wise what are the high yielding corn, and we try to combine them. Okay, but it turns out that genetics can provide much richer information in this process. And by doing that, we can actually improve this performance. And, um, and, and in this specific study, we were using something called Look Ahead. So we are using a simulation platform to look at the target generation, what kind of genetic information we have, and also predicted the phenotype of interest. And then we can come back and make our decision in our current generation. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll just go. And then the next one is we're using optimization based what's called training set selection. So think about when we have, let's say 5,000 seed, type of seeds, but we can only have the resource to, field to do field testing on 2,000 of these. And we have the genetic information, let's say one million SNP or marker. Now the question is that given that genetic information, which 2,000 can we select? and test it in what kind of environment. So this is a very data intensive um, decision-making problem. And what we did was we use um, what called an integer programming. And first we did some data pro processing, pro processing to generate a, a what's called distance matrix between the C's. And then we are trying to maximize the difference. So basically you're trying to cover as much variety as possible and in as big of a, in a variety of environment as possible in this process. And uh, the next one is called precision egg. And this is related to um, data science as well as decision making as well. The concept that comes from farming by soil. So basically, uh, historically, people are just say, I don't care about what's, what happened before. I, this is the type of seed I have been um, planting, I have been using, and I'm going to continue using this, right? Now the question is that given the amount of information we have, we have the historic yielding information. We have the type of soil we, um, we know, what kind of soil we have. And also we have a lot of, for example, drone type of information, weather station. And now the question is that given rich amount of information and also GIS, we can make all kinds of decisions. For example, irrigation planning. I know Iowa, we don't irrigate, for example, in Nebraska and other states, we have to think about irrigation and seed selection, fertilizer application, what kind of routing so that it's best to plant during the uh, planting season as well as in um, season uh, fertilizer application, pesticide, vehicle routing. And in that process, not just the uh, um, money, economic impact, we also need to think about what kind of environmental impact, right? So here you can think about some multi-objective decision-making, what kind of trade-off you have when you are making a decision in uh, integrating all kinds of data sources. And let's see, um, I have quick, a few quick slides to talk about some remote sensing. So, um, in remote sensing is another hot area in agriculture that actually uh, result a lot of uh, rich amount of data. Okay, it's the first one is called uh, UAV, and um, I'm collaborating with um, um, people in the uh, plant um, plant pathology department. They were looking at flying the drone over uh, soybean field to detect the type of disease. Um, there are different types of disease uh, we are um, analyzing. And then the next one is track mounted tools. This can provide closer look at different types of plant as well as their growth um, stages. And also you can make a decision in terms of whether to uh, provide additional um, in-season management um, intervention. The last type is called satellite. So satellite, it's very cheap. 
right? So you once it's um, you've set it up the system, um, it, the marginal cost is very low and it can be continuously monitored. Um, each of these can provide each rich model information, but there are pros and cons of each type of data in terms of the resolution, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the type of image data you're pro processing in that, uh, in that uh, problem. And this is one specific that we were doing for soybean sudden death syndrome disease detection uh, during the season. So in this specific study, we were using actually sat satellite image and um, we're going through a stage of uh, pre-processing as well as data processing in this case and basically convert image information to NDVI and RGB information. And also there are all kinds of visualization our data science can do. And also this is the decision making in terms of making classification on whether there is a disease or not. And also when I got the invitation, I was asked to provide some of, reflect my experience on and provide some advice in data science. I think reflect my um, career journey in this area. I think the first one that, that I would share is be open-minded. Um, I was trained as an engineer, but I'm just genuinely interested in uh, this agricultural area. And of course I have other applications as well, but for data science, in order for us to make an impact, and for example, like Alicia talked about, or Dr. Carrie Curie talked about earlier, I think it's, it's her interest in you know, making a difference in those you know, possible mistake people, right? In, in those people's life. And, and, and we, we can bring data science to, to make the accuracy higher, which can impact how we, when, when a mistake is made, is making a huge impact in an individual people's life. So I would say be open-minded and embrace challenge in all kinds of applications. And oftentimes challenge can bring opportunities. Um, in my uh, career stages, I've worked on all kinds of applications. It certainly changed from to time to time, but I've learned a lot over the different applications interacting with people. And also committed to continuous learning and self-improvement. I'm not trained in, um, in data science. But um, when there is a need, I think uh, your pri prior training in, in the area and then your inner drive to improve can help you prepare in this type of application. And also focus on strengths and collaborate. Um, don't try to be the expert in every area. I collaborate with a lot of people in agriculture, in plant science, in genetics. And this is where you can really make an impact and they will appreciate the type of expertise we as a data scientist to bring. And with that, I will end. I think the potential, I want to end with this quote I found online. So the potential benefit of artificial intelligence are huge, but so are the dangers, right? So it's important for us to be responsible and make the right decision or make the right application or, or impact in this area as a data scientist. And with that, I will stop here and answer any question you may have. Thank you for the great talk, Dr. Hu. And now we take some questions. And because we are behind of the time, uh, we just bring uh, we just escaped the break and just watch uh, a short video. And now Javad uh, asks question. Okay, let's start Q&A session. Uh, feel free I'll to start. type your question on the uh, chat. Uh, okay, the first question is that, which kind of machine learning model did you use for the crop yield prediction? Great question. So uh, for this, for the crop yield prediction, it was mainly predictive analysis, right? And then this is our current stage, but next stage, right? So given we know that input output relationship, the next stage is go to the prescriptive and then maybe we can provide decision support in terms of, you know, for this type of field, what kind of seed should we plant and when to plant? and when to apply fertilizer. Is it in season or is it pre-season or is it multiple times of application over the year? Because you have those as input when you are doing prediction. So when you're doing prescription, then those are decision variables you need to decide. 
Okay. Uh, great, thanks. Uh, uh, just uh, one, qu another question. How big your data set uh, was uh, in, for your research? Yeah, so a uh, different application has different size of data set. Sometimes uh, they are actually very small <laughs> for this uh, specific. So for example, for our genetics, um, genomic selection, the genetics vector is about 1 million. Um, so, it's good. so basically it is 1 million by two, 1.3 million by two. So that's the genetic vector information. But in terms of the yield, uh, we use the data in the USDA database. So it has the um, yield data from the last 30 years. Um, so that's about uh, the type of data set we are dealing with. But what I want to say is that it's not necessarily the size of data, is what you want to achieve with the data. Another thing that I did not talk in this talk was um, another study, we were doing microbiome study. And in this specific study, uh, we faced too small of a data set problem. So when I say too small, I'm talking about the observations are actually too few, sort of similar to Alicia, <laughs> the, the type of problem <laughs> Alicia has, right? So we, on one side, we actually have a lot of genetics information and we want to understand how that contributes to the community of microbiome. But for measurement, we have very limited amount of data. Now the question is that given the limited amount of data, how do you make sense of it? And it, so, so that's actually uh, one of the challenges, right? So one side is that we have too much data and the other side is we have too few observations. I think that's common for a lot of sort of big data problem, but it's actually information. Um, I shouldn't say information poor because there are information in the genetics data as well, but it's it, it, th there, there's some problem in, in, in the data as well. So it's not just how much data you have. Great, yeah. thank you. Uh, Dr. Ho, uh, the, our time is up. I'm uh, sorry, but unfortunately we don't have a time to read all the question. Uh, thanks Dr. Hu for sharing her uh, interesting and engaging uh, research in agriculture. Uh, okay, uh, thanks all for uh, attending our events. Let's watch a video for Women in Data Science and we'll come back soon, uh, be with us. on gaining importance all around the world, providing loads of opportunities for important. Data science has never been so important as it is now, and it keeps on gaining importance all around the world, providing loads of opportunities and, and really helping change the way we do business, the way we take care of ourselves and, and of the planet. It is so important to have women in artificial intelligence in the area of data science and also in leadership roles. It's being able to use data to solve issues and understand bigger problems, it's critical. If that is going to become completely data-driven over time, then you can't miss that opportunity. You've got to join in and, 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 and have your say. Because data science is becoming more and more important, uh, really imperative that people that work on problems related to data science, that report out and make data-driven decisions, uh, are a true representation of the world, regardless of gender, regardless of where you're from. AI and machine learning data science, they all have this amazing, incredible potential for impact. But Imagine the potential if we added more diversity. The future is diverse. Our world is becoming increasingly complex, more interconnected. To be fully engaged citizens in the 21st century, we need to embrace diversity in all aspects of life. We're thrilled to host this year's 24-hour virtual around the world conference that we called WITS Worldwide particularly in this really challenging year where we all crave community and connection. This year, we're celebrating International Women's Day by celebrating these amazing female role models in the field of data science, machine learning, and AI. We are going global on a whole new and much bigger scale. 
And the global perspective is really at the core of everything we're doing now. And I'm excited to share that the conference today features over 40 plenary speakers from over 25 countries. That's across all continents except for Antarctica. So we're still looking for a great speaker for next year there. Hosting a virtual event has provided an opportunity for our WIS ambassadors to enjoy even more community and more collaboration, which I know we all need during this pandemic. The WIS Datathon has also grown up around this concept of building a global community. In fact, this year's Datathon is our largest yet. We have participation from over 3,600 people from over 85 countries. And they're all working together, um, some across borders, uh, on a healthcare data set focus on intensive care units and hospitals. I'm particularly thrilled to announce a new initiative in WITS, the WITS Workshops, an educational program where people from all levels and all backgrounds can learn more about data science from outstanding women around the world. We're kickstarting WITS workshops at this conference with 14 brand new workshops that we'll be posting online after the conference as well. And this is just a start. From now on out, every month we'll add new workshops to uh, this program. Join us for WITS workshops. As a professor, I'm always thinking about how to broaden participation in statistics and data science? What are gateways to the field outside of calculus? What are other ways to enter our profession? I love speaking to a room full of talented women. There's just something about it. We're so happy that you can join us here and at the Woods Regional events. Enjoy. Thank you for being with us. Now, Aishwarya, introduce our next speaker. Thank you, Zara. Hi guys, my name is Aishwarya. So I'll be taking you forward. So our next speaker is Dr. Carolyn Lawrence Dill. Dr. Carolyn is a professor in the Department of Genetics, Development and Cell Biology at Iowa State. She has devoted over 20 years to developing computational systems and solutions that support the plant biology research community her research projects integrate biology and computer science with an understanding of human computer interaction, natural language processing, and engineering principles. She is also a founding member of the North American Plant Phenotyping Network and a creator of an NSF funded research traineeship program that combines principles of plant biology, engineering, and computer science. Today, she's going to talk about describing traits using natural language teaching computers to think like people. Dr. Caroline, it's so good to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, let me see if I can get my PowerPoint up and shared. Um, it's not showing. Maybe I can just share the whole screen. Do you see it? Yep. Fantastic. So my title is going to be what I talk about toward the end of the presentation. Um, what I really want to do is to talk some about my career and the challenges that I've faced, and then we'll get to the research. Um, part of the research that's old stuff will be described during the career section. The reason that I've made this uh, focus, like Gui Ping was saying, uh, contain the career and the challenges portion as sort of large parts of the seminar is because it was requested. So here we go. So if this is the United States, and hopefully you can make that out, it's not too tiny on your screen. The first place that I went to college was in Arkansas. I got a Bachelor of Arts, which is not so common these days among people that do the kinds of things that we do, at Hendricks College, which is uh, a tiny liberal arts school. After that, I went to Texas Tech University where I got a master's degree, and I, I worked on cotton physiology um, in Texas. If you've ever driven through West Texas, you know there's an awful lot of cotton. Um, 
after I got that master's degree, I went to the University of Georgia. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the work I did there because all the work I had done up to that point was entirely biology and entirely plant biology. And it was pretty traditional. And the description here is really how it was that I went from being interested in working on biological problems in a wet lab to really focusing on data science. And the way I got there was because I was interested in how chromosomes move. So what you see in this picture on the left here that was generated by Hongguo Yu, this is called a spindle um, in purple. So when your cells divide, the microtubules form this thing called a spindle. It's called that because it looks like a spindle if you were sewing, if any of you are seamstresses out there. So the spindle, when the chromosomes have duplicated and they're dividing right before the cell divides into two cells that each get some of the chromosomes, each get equal copies of the chromosomes, those chromosomes have to move within a single cell to the poles and then the cell has to divide into two separate cells. And that's what these chromosomes are doing here. The chromosomes are in green. And the thing you see in red is called a centromere kinetochore complex. And what that is, is a piece of DNA that's stuck to a bunch of proteins. And some of those microtubules interact with that centromere and that's what they use to move to the poles of the spindle with. And so the lab that I was working in for my PhD, what we worked on was how do the chromosomes move? And some of this was known in animals, um, less was known in plants. So remember this is um, now more than 20 years ago, which I just shocks me to even have that come out of my mouth. The person that you see here in the top image is Kelly Daw. Kelly works on corn. He's still working on corn. Um, he was my major professor, my co-major professor was Russell Malmberg. And Russell was an interesting co-major professor because he was interested in computing on biological data before bioinformatics was really a thing. And so I kind of got lucky in that I had these two individuals mentoring me as I went along as this field that at the time was new was arising. So at that time, this is what we thought that a centromere kinetochore complex looked like. So this turquoise stuff here in the middle, maybe it's a little more purplish, that's where your chromosomes are. So I've completely thrown out the chromosomes here for this figure. And what you see is this blob that is the kinetochore. The kinetochore is protein. And some of the proteins that are in there are motor proteins. And what these motor proteins do is they, this is the microtubule that's part of the spindle in yellow the motor proteins grab on to some kind of cargo, and in this instance, the cargo is a chromosome, and they stick to the microtubules, and either the microtubules are shrinking and they just hold on, or they actually walk to the poles. This image that you see here is showing all of the proteins that were known to do that, that were uh, motor proteins that were in animals. And we assumed that plant kinetochores were gonna be just like animals and we were wrong. So what we did find out is that dynenes, which is shown here in green, which is the major motor protein in animals that moves anything poleward, that moves anything to the pole end of a spindle, those were completely absent in flowering plant genomes. And so then we were left with a question, these things that are doing it in animals, where are they in plants or what are plants doing instead? So the way that we figured this out, that they are absent, is because this was during the time that uh, for the first time we were fully sequencing plant genomes. So we had a brand new full genome for a little plant called Arabidopsis and a brand new genome for, uh, for rice. And we could search those two genomes and it wasn't just that one part of dynein miss was missing, it was all of the parts of dynein that were missing from both of the genomes that were available to us. So um, this is one thing that's sometimes hard to do is to uh, publish something that is a negative result. So this is the other kind of motor protein, um, uh, kinesin. So kinesin, uh, what I'm showing you here is a phylogenetic tree. We sequenced a bunch of motor proteins, kinesins in uh, maize, 
primarily. And what you see in green are plant kinesins and what you see in red are animal kinesins and what you see in purple are from uh, fungi. And so one of the things that may be really obvious to you is there are places in this tree for these families of proteins. These are families within the kinesin superfamily and they each do different things. You see some families that have very few plant proteins like this one that's called kinesin one. And then you see others like these C-type that have a whole lot of plants, uh, proteins. It turns out these strange C-type motors do in fact move cargoes to the spindle poles. And it turns out that since this was published, um, one of the families that plants use to do that movement is uh, this unique um, motor that is in um, plants primarily. So one of the other motors up here that you see, let's see uh, at the top, it says I type. That means that the motor portion of the protein is in the middle. And those were already known to be kinetochore proteins. And one of the things that I did was to design based on the sequence of this I type protein, um, an antibody that should work in all plants. And what I'm showing you here are chromosomes that we isolated from faba bean and from barley. And we use that antibody and it does recognize specifically those kinetochores. So by looking at sequence, we were able to design these, these uh, antibodies that were specific to that particular protein. And in fact, for the I type proteins that were at kinetochores, uh, they were present in both plants and animals and for other proteins, they were, they were not. So this is all well and good, but one of the things that became obvious in working through this was that the literature was super confusing. So this is how I start to get into doing some real data science. So among kinesins, there were these things that were monomeric. So there's one protein uh, subunit. There were others that walk on uh, spindle fibers like I was talking about earlier that are dimers and that's how they walk like little feet. And so these that, that are homodimers have two of the same protein. The ones that are heterodimers have two different proteins that come together to make this apparatus that can walk. There's a portion that's called the tail, there's a neck, and there's a motor. And if you look just at the motor, which is the microtubule binding domain, and you looked at all the different kinesins that were out there, where that motor exists in the sequence can either be on one end called the N-terminal end of the protein in the middle or in the other end of the protein. And people were calling in the literature all of these different kinesin families that I just showed you by a bazillion different names. And uh, some of the motors that they were calling I-type didn't have the motor in the middle of the sequence. And they were making all kinds of inferences that didn't make much sense. So if we look at where the motors actually exist, rather than that schematic on the left, among those families, you see them sort of scattered in different places, the motor being dark here. So there was a lot of miscommunication among cell biologists. And I was in a botany lab and none of the cell biologists working, especially you can imagine in human cell biology had any interest in having conversations with me because I was a grad student and I was in a botany lab. But what we ended up doing because I drove these poor people crazy was I got a lot of people together to have all of these conversations about what they ought to be called. And we had proposals for what the different families ought to be called. And the group of people that was publishing on Kinesin voted on what they would start calling these things. Um, and we ended up uh, with these systems. Everybody had one they wanted to win. This was not easy to accomplish, but we did manage it. And it turns out the most boring possible outcome is what it is that we did. So what got voted in place is there are now kinesin families, one, two, three, four, five, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it turns out right now, um, if you go look at this paper that we published, it has 800 citations and counting. So that was a paper that was just because basically I was confused and mad and I was not, um, I guess I would say, um, 
worried enough about what all of these people in medicine thought about me as a grad student that I didn't just annoy them until we got this done. So if you wanna learn more and hear more about um, the details of how that got accomplished, there is a podcast out there that Taproot did. It was a really feel good outcome, but it blew my mind at the time and even looking back on it now that organizing data and how people talk about and name their things could be so important for how those people were communicating their science and whether they could make good inferences on and uh, create new hypotheses that were really grounded in reality instead of just uh, their ideas on what they should call things. So this really is for me how it was that I got into data science and that was because it was clear to me that I could do things that impacted lots of scientists to do their work better. So this was again at the University of Georgia and remember I have by this point never gone north of the Mason-Dixon line and then I moved to Iowa and I froze my first winter. Um, I did a postdoc at Iowa State with Volker Brendel, who is no longer at Iowa State, but um, I'm glad he was here because I'm still here now. So I did a postdoc with Volker, and then I spent a period of time as a research geneticist for the USDA ARS, about 10 years there. And then, much to my surprise, Iowa State University had a targeted hiring um, seven years ago now. They were looking for people in big data, and they asked me to apply for a job and recruited me without competition. It was one of the weirdest things that has ever happened to me. I felt like I had won the lottery. So I became a faculty member at Iowa State, an associate professor in two different departments. So I describe that as I feel like I won the lottery, but I can tell you it also creates some challenges to show up at a university like that. So first, I will tell you, living in Iowa, one of the things that I consider to be a challenge is that I sound like I grew up in the South, y'all. Um, anywhere I go, people smile at me, either because they like how I talk or they think I'm dumb. And that's just a thing in the United States that if you have a Southern accent, that, that's one of the things that people may think. Uh, something else that I think is a challenge that is pretty clear uh, these days is that culture, the patriarchy, and deeply held unconscious biases are real. And we struggle with these things and try to understand them and figure out when they're affecting us. And uh, it's, it's just a thing that we have to deal with. Um, back to this, how I got to Iowa State, coming into a job from what everybody else considers to be a side door can create challenges to and from others who didn't go through that same door. And what I mean by that is when you have people that have been working at an institution and they followed a particular path to get where they are, if they have any concept that you got there some easier route, they may make your life a little bit harder. So that doesn't necessarily have to be um, what it is that I just presented to you, which is getting recruited to a university in the way that I did, but there are situations where whether it's valid or not, someone may perceive that you got there a different way and you may have to struggle with that. So remedies, that's important. Um, I find it important to think about why and how um, I and others think the things that we do, and I try to understand. Um, I'm not a patient person, but I've learned to be patient, especially with other people. I am super good at apologizing. I screw up all the time. And um, I recommend apologizing when you make mistakes as quickly as you humanly can make the apology. And Gui Ping mentioned this, being open to change and opportunities. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I was going to someday be identified as a data scientist. It was not my goal. Um, never did I think that I was going to not work for the federal government and come to work as a faculty member. I used to tell people that I wouldn't want to be a faculty member because it looked like an awful lot of work and I didn't wanna to have to bring in my own money and have you lost your mind? Why would I do that to myself? And I was so delighted when I was able to come. 
So all this said, here's this slide that when I show you this slide, I feel like it's, um, it's some heavy stuff. Here's what I really think. What I really think is that when someone says you can't do it, do it twice and take pictures. This is something that every time you come up against something that you know you can do and there is that obstacle, if you think of this and you overcome it, create your evidence and walk on. So with that, we are finally to my research, my current research. Remember what I showed you earlier was 20 years ago. What do I do now? Um, well, I'm on Twitter, so you can follow me on Twitter. And I like to tell people when they say, what do you work on? Because I work on a lot of different things. I work on plants and computers. So if you wanna know about the projects that I work on, you can look at my Google Scholar page. Um, there are lots of different things in agriculture primarily. What I showed you earlier was a standardized kinesin nomenclature and how we got there. Now I'm gonna to go to the other end of the spectrum. I was saying, you know, we have to talk about these things with a controlled vocabulary. And now I'm gonna say, we should never have to use controlled vocabularies ever again. We're now describing traits using natural language and trying to teach computers to use that natural language to understand what it is that we mean. For many, many years, we've told people, use these standard methods and we're saying to people, you, the person, act like a computer so that the computer can compute on this stuff. And now that we have natural language processing and machine learning algorithms, it becomes possible for us to teach the computers to have a semantic understanding of what it is that the meaning of some of our concepts are. So with that, um, I'm gonna tell you a little story about what Ian Braun does in my lab. He computes on phenotype descriptions. A phenotype is what something looks like. And um, a trait might be uh, kernel color. These are some seeds. And a researcher could ask what genes are responsible for or related to this phenotype where some seeds are colored and some seeds are colorless. So this colorless um, phenotype is uh, created by an allele called colorless two of a gene that is called colorless two. And so generally the way we do this in, uh, in um, bioinformatics, this may make you think of what Alicia was talking about with um, similarities and trying to align um, the ballistic prints we take sequence from a genome of a plant that we know is responsible for that phenotype. We do something called blasting, which basically says match my sequence to the other sequences that are like it. And we get back other sequences that are like it. And so it finds itself, but it also finds other genes. And then we can look at where those genes are on a biochemical pathway that makes those uh, pigments. And in this instance, those two genes that we found, the place that they map is to this one, uh, this one step in this pathway called CHS, where anthocyanin, the pigment, is what comes out of this biochemical pathway. Um, when we describe, in, instead of looking at sequence, when instead we describe what the phenotype is, we could say that the kernels or the seeds lack color we can query with phenotype descriptions against other phenotype descriptions. And what we get back are all of these phenotype descriptions that are associated to specific genes and they map all over that pathway. And so what that means is that we're able to query for what it is we care about, which is the trait, and to come up with all different kinds of uh, genes. We're not limited to the ones that match the gene we started with. Um, the, the most important thing to bear in mind about this, on the far right here, if we didn't have that pathway, we would still have this group of genes that we would be able to say our hypothesis is that they're involved in the same process. So it's a hypothesis generating technique. Um, I'm not going to go into the details since I went into the details earlier in this talk about other parts of my career. But I will tell you that if you go to this link that says quotes.dill-pickle.org, this is the tool that Ian has created that does exactly what it is that I just showed you. 
And if you want a full-blown whole hour seminar on how it is that, that process works, Ian recently defended, and if you go to the link that's at the top left here, you can listen to the details of how it is that natural pr language processing works so that we can actually compute on these um, descriptions of phenotype. I have another student I wanna tell you about, Colleen, and she's applying some of the methods that Ian has generated to a field environment. So I realize this is busy, but I'm gonna walk you through it. On the top here, you have an overall process of what it is that Colleen is working on. And on the bottom, you have an example. To the left, what she's doing, so imagine you are somebody that's trying to uh, phenotype a field of maize plants and you have traits that you wanna describe. Um, what we do right now in those fields is we walk through the field and we have to write down specific traits and measure them in certain ways. But instead, what Colleen has as her PhD project is to let people walk through the field and just talk to their phone and describe what they see in different parts of the field. And so when people have described their plants, then we can generate networks of similarity and descriptions across different lines. We can figure out where there are clusters where phenotype descriptions have semantic similarity. And then those clusters can be considered to be together a synthetic phenotype. If we have what we're calling a cluster of synthetic phenotypes, then we can use that to see if there are regions of the genome where there are patterns that associate with those phenotypes based on uh, what the lines of plants were that we were looking at in the field. So what we're planning to do this summer is it's called GWAS, it's genome-wide association studies on these synthetic phenotypes. And right now, Colleen is looking for students that would do this work with us this summer in the field. And so with that, um, I covered today my career in brief, some of the challenges that I've experienced that you may experience some similar challenges, a little bit about what our research is and the hope that you'll go and check out some of what it is that um, were the links that I uh, gave to you in the seminar. And last but not least, I should acknowledge. And I will say that the people that are involved, I showed you and told you the names of the people that were, were primarily involved, but they are too numerous to count. This is one of the things we talk about when we're looking at um, Petri plates that have bacteria growing on them. How many colonies are there? They are too numerous to count. But um, long-term, I would say, um, great appreciation to my parents, my husband, my son, because these people put up with me, Darwin Campbell, who is a program coordinator in my research group. Everything I talk about, Darwin is the person that actually does them. And then finally, over the pandemic, these two have really gotten me through it. So with that, I'm open for questions. And thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I think we are a little behind our schedule, so we wouldn't be taking questions, but we can have that like after we are done with the session, if we have a few minutes left, we can just go back, okay? okay. So moving on, um, our next speaker is, just let me share my screen. I forgot it last time and I apologize. So can you guys see my screen? Okay. So our next speaker is Dr. Azadeh Shaidei. Dr. Shaidei is an assistant professor in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at Iowa State. She obtained her master's and PhD in Mechanical Engineering from Michigan State University. Her research focuses on designing heterogeneous microstructural materials and metamaterial systems as well, as well as application of data science in material design and advanced manufacturing. Dr. Shaidei has received research and educational grants from NSF, CAAT, KEEN. She is a recipient of the Zonda, Zonta International Amelia Earhart Fellowship. She is also a mentoring officer at the Female Researchers Chapter of the International Association for Computational Mechanics. Today, she's going to talk about accelerating material discovery with machine learning. Dr. Shadi, thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Nicole, for the nice introduction. 
Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So the title of my today's presentation is Acceleration, Accelerating Material Discovery with Machine Learning. Um, so my background is computational material science, and I had a collaboration with uh, material uh, scientists uh, in processing and experimental uh, characterization uh, back in Michigan when I was a PhD student and also faculty. And then um, we had uh, actually some common uh, joint uh, publication on computational and experimental work. Uh, but back in the day, we, the machine learning was, wasn't available uh, for us. Uh, so we have introduced ourselves to machine learning because of a, a different reason that I am going to explain to you. The traditional material design that uh, we have um, for the past uh, is uh, when you have, um, I cannot find my laser pointer. It's very small here, uh, laser pointer, okay. So the, traditionally, what, how we process materials is that we make them in the lab, mostly with the ad hoc methods. Somehow, if it's not uh, insulting to the experimentalist is by try and error, they mix the materials uh, uh, in the lab with different volume fraction of the composite material, for example, and then they test it and see what would be the best um, property for that material, not just mechanical property, it can be multifunctional property like electrical con conductivity, thermal conductivity, permeability, and so on. So this top uh, image is exactly what we have done in the composite research lab, um, uh, the material processing. We combine the nanofibers with polymers that reinforce the polymers, gives them multifunctional property using the injection molding um, process. So this is one of them. We have variety different um, processing methods to make this composite samples. And then uh, in parallel to that experimental work, what we do is that we create a equivalent um, uh, um, simulation, uh, simulated material in the uh, finite element software or, or uh, codes that we write based on the uh, statistical methods to represent the uh, macrostructure of the material. So if you know the macrostructure of the material, you can easily scale it up and calculate the property of the material in the higher scale. Then uh, we can uh, get the property um, call, uh, the directly from the experiments in the top um, image uh, and also from the uh, computational one. For many years, uh, experimentalists and computational people try to do these things. So uh, specifically the material I worked on was nano reinforced composites, which is a class of composite material that um, can give uh, multifunctionality to the material, like uh, creating the anti-icing uh, property. And also you can create the barrier or liquid um, to, against the liquid or gases. Uh, so it has um, application in the pharmaceutical uh, industry and also packaging. And also you can create the anode or cathode of the uh, lithium ion batteries out of this material. And uh, also you can create, uh, for example, transparent conducting field. So this is, uh, in the past, this is how we uh, actually designed the material, both experimentally and uh, computationally. Then, um, uh, then I switched to the new class of the material that I'm going to focus on explaining it, uh, which is um, similar to the nanoparticles, but it's a particulated composite material, which is liquid metal composites. So liquid metal composite, as you can see in this picture, my experimentalist colleague, they are combining the uh, liquid um, particles with elastomers. And then they, they create the material that can stretch 500 uh, times, uh, as you can see in this image. Uh, and you can create a, a stretchy material. It has application in soft robotics. So, so similar to the other composites, the way that they are doing this 
uh, processing in the lab is by try and error ad hoc method and they are uh, it's a very uh, expensive process uh, material wise and also processing and also um, you need to uh, have people to do these experiments and also processing for you so in parallel to this um, research we uh, propose a new method uh, to create the um, a statistical equivalent macrostructure to this material system computationally. And we validated that um, uh, method with the experiment and then we created our database. This is the overview of the research that we recently actually published in a paper of comp uh, computational material science. So what we are doing here is that we design uh, uh, the experiment in uh, computational uh, section, which means that we create too many uh, samples uh, computationally with different scenario for the composite material. So materials can have a, a loading or uh, volume fraction from zero to and up to 90%, this material uh, can withstand even up to 90% uh, particulated composite volume fraction. And then we generate a macrostructure using the packing code that we have developed, which is based on the um, very um, uh, advanced mathematical um, algorithm that create for us um, actually uh, the macrostructure of this material. And then we um, homogenize this um, material using the fast Fourier transformation uh, method that we adopted from the literature. This method that we are doing is equivalent to what experimentalists are doing in the lab. So they create the material and then they test it. So we have done the same thing. We validated with your, with our experimentalist data, uh, uh, data is, which is available for one time. And then we generated too many uh, samples uh, and at the end of the day, what we did here is that we have a database of too many mm, macrostructure of the material, and then using a neural network, uh, we are going to uh, uh, actually see the output. Uh, we have input and output, and then we train the neural network based on this database. And then uh, someone uh, like experimentalist colleague can tell us that okay, I have uh, this type of material with this ty uh, type of um, fibers and this uh, much volume fraction and uh, other um, parameters for the um, fibers. And then in a, within a second, we can tell them exactly what is the property of that material. So that material property can be anything, mechanical, electrical, uh, and uh, thermal, it depends of the material system. So this is a direct method. Um, I'll show you a little bit of um, uh, uh, detail of this one. So the, the software, the, the database that we have generated is an open source database which is available for the public that uh, can um, actually be easily adapted for the uh, different class of the material. So we have uh, over 1,000 um, uh, uh, 1, samples in that database uh, with uh, equivalent uh, homogenized property uh, using or FFT homogenization code. And these are the uh, detail of the uh, inclusion or the fibers. So these fibers, uh, are like ellipsoidal, uh, uh, so made of the uh, liquid type um, uh, fibers. Uh, this is a very unique material system because the fiber is um, uh, liquid, is not solid. Uh, so then uh, we have uh, or design um, parameters are volume fraction of the fibers is aspect ratio and also uh, the average size and also, the, uh, between the sphere and ellipsoidal, we have a choice to take. Uh, so we had the design of experiment DOE, and we successfully um, um, filled the design space uh, for the different um, parameters, like uh, aspect ratio of the fibers uh, as a function of volume fraction. And you can see that we, our database is um, homogenized uh, in this one that can uh, be easily used for the neural network and machine learning training. Uh, so um, this is a, just a quick slide about our uh, FFT homogenization uh, 
a method that we have uh, adopted from the literature and it wrote a code based on that to create to give us the property of the uh, material directly from the computational uh, macrostructure uh, and um, our previous uh, published paper uh, on this domain uh, actually um, validated the Mm, this uh, has been validated or modeled with uh, experimental uh, work by our colleagues. So this green uh, lines show the experiment and our work FFT is very close to uh, this one. The other curves uh, are uh, some empirical equations and not very um, uh, accurate, especially in the higher loading and higher volume fraction. So this is uh, um, our takeaway from our previous work to our current work to, uh, to create a database for us. Um, so then we train the machine learning. I don't go through the details of this. And we have tested the performance of our uh, machine learning method. Uh, so we showed that uh, on the y-axis is the um, property obtained for the thermal conductivity of the material. Uh, for the, this material uh, from the machine learning and in the y-axis is from the FFT homogenization method that you can see that it's uh, equal to y equal x, uh, let's say. And uh, we can say that uh, with a very good um, uh, accuracy, we can use the fast uh, machine learning method uh, because um, honestly, the one with the FFT uh, thermal conductivity homogenization it takes days to create a result for us. But when we do this training once, you can interpolate uh, the result for any uh, other macrostructure for your need. Uh, these are just showing that how much this um, uh, coverage we had for the different uh, thermal conductivity versus the aspect ratio and the volume fraction of the um, uh, volume fraction of this um, uh, inclusion in the composites. Uh, so uh, the uh, next step that we have done, direct um, uh, training was uh, not a big deal. We were doing it very fast, but the inverse uh, design is a problem. So inverse design means that um, manufacturer tells you that, okay, I want to have a material uh, go and make it in the lab for me that uh, has this uh, property, mechanical property one, electrical property two, and thermal conductivity three. So you need to be able to come up with the material uh, with uh, different um, uh, design parameters uh, to give them that uh, specific um, um, property. So we call it the inverse learning or inverse design of the material. So we were able also to do this uh, inverse learning, uh, which is uh, we have a property and we then we go and look for the uh, for the macrostructure, which is equivalent to that. And then we ask our experimentalist uh, colleague to make those material in the lab. So uh, with that, um, uh, so my talk is very short. <laughs> so. Uh, Thank you so much. Okay. Over to you, Javad. Do we have time for a quick question? Okay. Uh, I want to thank uh, Professor Shedai for uh, presenting a great application of the machine learning in material design. Let's start a uh, Q&A session. Uh, we have a one question. Uh, one of them is uh, how big data set uh, was for training the neural networks and for your works? So uh, that's a good question. As you, I showed you here, uh, we uh, we want to have a minimum um, number of data set because this uh, co computational or uh, computationally they are very expensive. So we had over one thousand uh, data set for that. Uh, for but uh, we uh, change it uh, and we found out that one thousand was optimal. So it's, it's about 1,000 points data set we have. Great. Uh, another question is that uh, which source of data set do you use? You got it uh, in the laboratory or you use it in a public data set? 
No, we create our own data set uh, using our packing method. Uh, uh, basically, the equation, uh, the picture up here, and this is one of the macro structure. We have a packing code that we um, change the volume fraction of the fibers with that and the orientation of the um, ellipsoidal and the aspect ratio and all these things and create different scenario for our uh, um, data set. So uh, one way is that for not for this application because this wasn't really uh, demanding for or other uh, macrostructure that we are currently working, we can use also uh, some experimentally obtained macrostructure and uh, add them to the pool of the computationally uh, macrostructure to make the database more comprehensive and get the better result. Thank you so much for comprehensive clarification. Uh, uh, also, I thank for an uh, interesting presentation. Uh, uh, also, we have a one uh, question from uh, Professor Lawrence. Uh, first, I uh, want to thank uh, for sharing her interesting works and uh, experience and uh, careers. Uh, the question is, uh, as an outstanding researcher with a, a broad experience in bioinformatics, how do you see the future of the data science applications in bioinformatics? Well, I don't think any of us is going to be out of a job anytime soon. So it turns out that the kinds of things that we're computing on now, um, it surprises me that we're able to do it. I'm delighted by it. Um, <clears throat> It, it certainly doesn't seem like um, any of the students that are graduating from the programs that are bioinformatics programs are having a, a terribly difficult time finding placement. In fact, um, there are many jobs that go unfilled. So I guess I would strongly encourage people to get a little bit of understanding of biology so that your data science skills can be applied there because I think that it's an area that's um, really ripe for an influx of people that have hardcore skills rather than people like me that have ideas and have to find people to work with with hardcore skills. Great, thank you so much for explanation. Uh, for the sake of time, we don't have a time to read all the question and we have to uh, also skip the uh, break. Now, uh, Saba, my friends, uh, introduce the next presentation. Yeah, thank you, Java. First, I want to thank everyone. We had great speakers from academia, so a round of applause for our great speakers from academia. Thank you so much. It was really inspiring. So next, we are going to have our speakers from industry. Feel free to grab a cup of coffee and get some rest. So uh, our next speaker is Dr. Feifei Wong. Actually, the three speakers that we have today, they earned their graduate degrees from Iowa State University. So it's great to see them back. Uh, Dr. Feifei Wong is a senior decision science consultant at Disney. She specializes in modeling and forecasting work supporting various company segments. She earned her master's degree in computer science in 2014 and uh, she did her PhD co-major in Applied Mathematics and Computer Science in 2017 in Iowa State University. In her free time, she likes to play piano and dance ballet. So please welcome Dr. Bong. Today, she's going to talk about analytics at Disney Decision Science. Thank you, Sava, for the introduction. So um, I'm going to share my screen. Please let me know if you can see my presentation. Yeah, we can see it. Great. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining this talk. I'm very, very excited to come back to Iowa State and um, have the chance to share my personal journey with you as a senior decision science consultant at the Walt Disney Company. So today, I will tell you more about my personal story, where I grew up, where I went to school, how I did my research, and uh, how did I land with Disney for the data scientist job. Before we jump into our stories journeys, we have to read this disclaimer first. The views expressed are my own and not necessarily those of the Walt Disney Company. Any analytics strategies or techniques attributed to Disney 
are not necessarily those that Disney may use in a given situation. So I actually grew up in China and did my undergrad in applied mathematics back in 2007 and to, uh, until I graduated in 2011. So after that, I actually joined Iowa State University from I, uh, 2011 all the way to 2017, doing my PhD co-major both in applied mathematics and computer science. My research at that time was actually very, very different from what I'm doing nowadays for data science. So I was working on robotics. We were doing impact dynamic modeling. So a lot of interesting things we do will be like, um, throwing like an object, how do we predict the trajectory? How do we compute the post velocity of the collision and so on? We use a lot of mathematical and numerical techniques to solve like partial differential equations uh, or ordinary differential equations. So I would say it's more like mechanical engineering, computer science, math modeling. We were not really using machine learning in my research field. So at around the end of my third year or beginning of my fourth year, I started to think about what should I do in the future? What do I want to do to go to my career? So at that time, I thought about a lot of things. I have so many paths I can choose. I enjoyed being a TA. I enjoyed teaching recitations or classes. So I could be like a lecturer, um, lecture professor teaching maybe calculus at a college or I could continue my robotics research being assistant professor at a university. Or maybe I could just become like a software developer doing Java or C++ programming all day. But were those all I wanted? I thought about more. Actually, my true passion is still both mathematics and computer science. So I thought about, oh, decision science or data science can be something very exciting and fit my background very well. I had a great opportunity back in 2014 or 2015. So I attended a 10 days workshop as mathematical modeling workshop at University of British Columbia. I joined a team of five people. Just within those 10 days, we were given a problem from Siemens, a real industry world problem for a prediction problem. So we created our own data, built the model, run the code, um, also presented the result, wrote a publication just within those 10 days. It was very exciting to me. I found that's what my true passion is. I really like the fast paced kind of working environment that you can deliver something really quickly. You can see your result right away and feel really accomplished. At the same time, I also enjoy the teamwork a lot. We work very, very closely with each other daily. And with those two factors in mind, I noticed that going to the industry could be one of my better options. So in 2017, I was very, very excited to actually um, receive an offer from Disney. I remember it was the second day after my PhD thesis defense. I flew to Orlando and did my on-site interview with Disney. At that time, I learned a lot more about what Disney projects are, and I met a lot of smart people. They are senior managers, they are directors. So I was really happy about my choice. I joined Disney in 2017, right after my graduation. It was my first real job. And till now, I still feel very excited working every single day for Disney. You can see here, I have a, we have a lot of wonderful events for example, we have our Disney data analytics conference that we invite famous speakers, um, even people from different industry, for example, like the, one of the Apple co-founder was in this picture. And we also have a lot of team events, different great talks within Disney company or among other companies as well. And in the middle picture here, you can see that's where I met Saba. She was one of our award winner for the Disney data analytics woman session. So she shared the result of her research at one of our innovation talk. We also have different, um, like you can see the SAP brought their robot. I also have tons of business travel opportunities because I support a lot of Disney studios work. 
So I traveled to Burbank, California a lot as well. So now I would like to share a little bit more details about what I actually do at Disney and I hope you will find it very interesting. So before that, I would also like to show you a very quick video about our technical director, McKay, talking about how he viewed decision science at Disney. Software for different arms of Disney. So we help uh, businesses make uh, better business decisions based on analytics, and we help to build the tools to help them do that. One of the things that we work on is a pricing tool for the resorts at Walt Disney World to help them develop promotions and uh, optimal prices. We have lots and lots of historical data on bookings and things like that at the Walt Disney World Resort, and we use mathematical models, statistical models uh, to measure how demand adjusts to different behavior. And then we try to pass that to some sort of optimization algorithm to help develop optimal business decisions. The favorite part of my job, that's probably getting to work on lots of uh, very challenging problems with lots of other people who are very smart. Everything that we do is somewhat a novel solution because every business problem is different and every business problem needs to be custom fit to the particular business unit. So everything that we work on it involves some amount of creativity. We work on uh, home entertainment sales, marketing return on investment for Disney home entertainment. Guess strategic value is, is the term that we use to refer to all the additional expenditures that guests have when they come to Walt Disney World. So guests don't come to just stay in our resorts. They come to play in the parks and to buy some of the cool merchandise and to, to spend money on uh, some of our dining locations. So strategic value refers to all of that additional spending. A lot of what I do has an impact on guest experience maybe even down the road. When the company does well, the company builds new cool experiences for the guests. We have Avatar, we just announced Star Wars Land. All of these things hinge on the profitability of the company. A lot of what I do helps fund future magical experiences for the guests. But we are, we, we nerds, we, we, we like data, we like analyzing data, we like crunching numbers and visualizing data. We, we love that type of thing. Let's get back to our presentation. I would want to say thank you, McKay, for the introduction of Disney Decision Science. As he said, we are, we are all nerds. We love data. So what do we actually do with the different company segments? Let's have a look together. So as most of the people may, familiar, may be familiar with Disney is through the Disney parks. So we have the first segment is parks, experience, and consumer products. For example, we have Disney World in Orlando. We have Disneyland in California. We have multiple locations of different Disney parks. We also have Disney Cruise Line and different um, Disney stores, publishing, and so on. Another very big segment will be media and entertainment distribution, especially nowadays with all the online streaming services, for example, Disney+, Plus, Hulu, ESPN+, Plus, Hotstar, and so on. The third big segment will be content groups, for example, the Walt Disney Studios, which is one of the segments I support the most for most of my projects. There are also very famous like Pixar, Marvel, and so on. They all belong to the studio content segment. For other general entertainment content, we have a lot of like ABC channels, Freeform, FX, and so on, even National Geographic. Disney is also the leader in the sports content. So as you may know, ESPN is also under Disney. With this many company segments being set here, what type of project we, we might. So for me, I really support a lot of the movies and films behind the scene. For example, like prediction of box offices, help with marketing ROI and so on. I'm really, really thrilled to say like Disney is actually a big leader in the film industry as well. So nine out of the 10, um, top 10 domestic opening box office film are actually Disney films. This is some data from back in January of 2021. 
Disney is really good at storytelling, making exceptional guest services and immersive experience. All those together give everybody an emotional connection with Disney content. So what is behind all the stuff is actually analytics. How does analytics play a role at Disney? I will mostly give you a high level introduction of the four projects. Two of them are under studios, media and home entertainment, while the other two are under parks and resorts. So the first two projects are about improving marketing effectiveness or choosing release date for movies. And the, the other two will be about room assignment because Disney has a lot of resorts and hotels and another part will be personalization. The first project, improving marketing effectiveness for movies. Actually, I have personally worked on something related to this. So the problem description is here. You can imagine that before any new movie releases, Disney would want to advertise the trailer on different channels, and we may spend a different amount of budget in the advertisement world. So how do we want to make a decision on when, where, and how much to buy media to promote those new movie releases? There are a lot of decisions we need to make. So it's definitely a combination of business knowledge, but we have the data. We want to do some analytics and show the result and build models to help with the business problem. So the solution here is actually to develop causal relationship framework from studying historical data. The tools we use are involved with forecasting, causal modeling, and optimization. So we want to truly understand what are the factors behind the scene driving, driving the effectiveness of the marketing, and how do we use optimization, optimization tools to allocate our budget in different channels in a smart way. Another very cool project that some of my coworkers work on is called movie release date, um, choosing the movie release date tool. So you can think about that Disney has so many films to release every single year, which weekend should I choose to release? So choose the release strategy for future Disney films to optimize the movie attendance. We kind of want to make sure that we have enough revenue return when we make those big movies. So the solution here is actually to apply analytics to scheduling with consideration include seasonality and competition. So here you can imagine if I'm going to release a film, I probably want to make sure I release, I release it at a good season. So it can be like holiday season when more people are having time off more people would like to go to theater and watch movies. Also, you also want to avoid those big competitors. Maybe Universal is releasing another big superhero movie. So it's probably not a good idea to release a Disney Marvel movie at the same weekend. The tools we use here are statistical modeling, game theory, and optimization. Sorry to interrupt. We have just more, one more minute. So, sounds good, thank you. So um, I can quickly go over, we also can uh, help with uh, assigning books to rooms to make sure the guests are having rooms ready when they arrive. So we would apply operations research and doing optimization. Also another interesting project is called personalization. So we can provide personalized message, product and recommendation for individuals. We will use big data analytics and machine learning to provide those recommendations. After I joined Disney, there are a lot of my previous faculty members, staff, students, and alumni came visited Disney World. Everybody had a great time. I was so happy to see my um, Iowa State fellows. At the end, I really wanted to say thank you so much for attending. Usually as a Disney cast member, instead of saying, have a good day, we will tell you, have a magical day. And thank you very much, everyone. And thanks for continuing supporting Disney. And please let me know if you have any questions.
Thank you, Fei Fei. It was great to know more about analytics, Disney decision science. So I'll pass it to Java to ask questions. I guess we can take one or two questions. Sounds good. Oh. Okay. Uh, first, thank Dr. Wang for uh, sharing uh, her uh, interesting works. Uh, first, thanks all of you for being with us so far, and feel free to type your question on the Q and A box. Okay. The first question is that which type of machine learning models and techniques do you use in the Disney? That's a very good question. We actually really use various types. It really depends on the specific project. We sometimes even use the very simple linear regression or for like binary classification, we can use logistic. There are also some deep learning, deep neural networks. It really um, very specific project based. Oh, great, thanks. That's another question. Which type of challenge do you face during your journey in Disney? That's very interesting. So I would say for me personally, I had a very different background from everybody else in my team. I did robotics. I wasn't doing like data science for my research before. So at first, when I first joined, I noticed that everybody has a very strong statistical background. So that's something uh, I picked up later over time. So I would spend additional time taking Coursera courses or maybe Udemy courses for machine learning specifically. So I try to brush up my memory from statistical courses from undergrad and so on. So I would say at the beginning, that's one of the big challenge. Another one would be the business knowledge. We, are, we were all from academia before. So whatever we were dealing with, it's very different from the business industry world. So I pick up a lot of business knowledge related to revenue management, marketing return on investment and so on. So those knowledge you will build up over time. You learn a lot from your leaders and also uh, at the same time, like you would want to search more materials online and try to teach yourself. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, one more question. Uh, how big your data science groups are in Disney? That's a great question. So we are only, uh, the decision science group is only a very small group under the revenue management. So we have about 40 data scientists. So most of us having a master's degree or PhD degree in statistic, math, or computer science. But Disney is huge. So under different segments, they all have their probably their own data science department. So for example, like Disney Plus, they probably have a special group of people supporting that. Disney Imagineering for the mechanical engineer, the rights analysis, they have some specific um, department as well. So I would say it's all over, yeah. Oh, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, our time is uh, nearly up. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot get to the all questions. Uh, thanks, Dr. Wang, for sharing uh, your journey with us and your pretty thank great you. presentation. Yeah, I will put my uh, email address in the chat. And thank you so much for the invite. Nice, nice. Thank you. Thanks, all of you, for uh, asking these interesting questions. Now, Sabo, introduce the next presentation. Yeah. So our next speaker is Dr. Binazi Fate. Can you see my slides now? Everyone, can you see my slides sharing? Okay, great. So Dr. Fateh works as an AI specialist at Google, helping Google Cloud's largest customers transform their businesses by solving problems they face with creating scalable end-to-end -end machine learning solutions. Benazir is a hands-on data scientist with diverse experience in research and in delivering scalable and productionalizable machine learning solutions. Benazir earned a PhD degree in computer engineering from ISU in May 2013. She is originally from India and currently resides in the San Francisco Bay Area. I'm going to pass it to Benazir. Thank you so much, Sabah. Um, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm very excited um, to and, and honored to be invited to speak at uh, my alma mater. Um, I graduated from Iowa State in 2013, and um, 
I'm very excited uh, to, to come back, uh, to, to be given this opportunity to come back and talk to my fellow Iowa Staters, my fellow Cyclones, uh, about a few things that, that I have learned uh, in, my, in my career. Um, so um, currently I am working as an ML specialist at Google Cloud and um, Sabah gave the introduction, so I won't go over that again. Uh, but today, what I wanted to talk about was, uh, you know, this this uh, this notion that um, learning never stops. Uh, it should never stop. It doesn't stop at the end of your graduation, um, and it it just continues going on um, throughout your career. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in this talk, uh, what I wanted to mainly cover was I, I wanted to talk about what has been my career so far. And you know this, this notion, this idea that, that I truly believe in, which is that your career is you know, not really a, a linear ladder. It, instead, it's a, it's a painting that you paint for yourself. Uh, I'll follow it up with uh, some top trends in AI and ML uh, that I see from my, uh, you know, in my current role at Google Cloud. I get to work with some biggest uh, uh, companies, uh, top technology companies, and how they are solving their AI ML challenges. Um, so I wanted to give a sneak peek on what are the top trends. Followed by, you know, in an AI organization, there are multiple roles uh, that fit different types of skills and different types of personalities. So when I was a grad student at Iowa State, um, sometimes I used to wonder, okay, what kind of a job would I get? Uh, I mean, I had made a choice that I would go into industry. So I always used to think, um, okay, what, what do people really do in a job? Um, so, you know, I wanted to touch on um, if it helps uh, people, you know, women or, or men who are graduating or about to graduate from Iowa State to understand what types of roles exist in an, in an AI organization. Um, so I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, so um, uh, I was a research assistant in computer engineering, um, uh, working towards my PhD uh, till 2012. Uh, then I took a short internship. Uh, I ended up in John Deere, um, learning a lot about precision agriculture. And during my five years at, at John Deere, I, I worked in multiple roles. Uh, I started in embedded solutions because that was closest to my PhD thesis area. But then my curiosity into, okay, what are the different places where precision agriculture, like different technologies that are merging and enhancing and you know, making precision ag avail, um, uh, possible. So I ended up becoming a mobile architect and a web architect after that. Uh, and to be honest with you, um, while till 2017, till I was at John Deere, somewhere in my mind, I had, I had imagined my entire life, my entire career at John Deere. I used to think that, okay, I'm currently I'm a mobile architect at, you know, so-and-so grade level. And in five years time, I want to be a chief architect at, you know, so-and-so grade level. And that's, that's how I was, I was thinking. Uh, but as my luck would have it, I found myself in, uh, I mean, we made a choice to move to India. And during that time when that, that I was in India, I didn't actively take up a job. Uh, instead, I was thinking, what else is happening in the world? And, and Bangalore was a startup ecosystem in India. So during that year, be it any conference, any workshop, any networking event, I found myself, I went there, I talked to people and I wanted to know what else is happening. You know, not just in precision agriculture, but in any, in any and every domain. And I found the, this pervasive use of AI and ML and data science and the, and the new power that you know, this new skill has. Um, and I used to work a little bit on data modeling and, and uh, data architecture while at John Deere also. So I, I built, up on those, built up on those skills. Uh, I took like Coursera courses, Udemy courses, and I started consulting some small startups while I was in India. That landed me a job with a startup called AI Enterprise, and I was a hands-on data scientist uh, till 2020. And at that point, I realized, I, I felt in myself that I have never done sales. And, you know, I said, what if I were to take up a job that involves like a component of it is, is pre-sales? And that's how I ended up at Google Cloud, because in my current role, I, I, I am a hands-on solutions architecture architect, but I also do pre-sales type of work. Um, next slide, please. 
so with 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 this whole um, career progression of mine at least this is what i want to say that uh, many times when we think of our career as a as a ladder in our mind we we limit ourselves we say okay it, it, you are you know you can only be in a particular domain if you want to go, grow higher uh, but when you let go of that notion of a career ladder you open up your mind to possibilities of moving laterally and you know how how can you do that like if you so desire if you so desire to uh, you know move laterally and expand on your skills these are some actionable tips that i've i've put here that have helped me one is to always be curious because you know your curiosity will take you places uh, it your curiosity will help you understand what are the new technologies that are coming up and in current world technologies are coming up they're merging together and they're creating new opportunities which you will be able to spot if you're continuously learning second develop not just the technical skills but the soft skills you know like things like leadership uh, good communication skills conflict resolution uh, those those type of skills will help you uh, take up any other job that you know outside of your you know things that you've done your masters or phd in um, and of course you should always have you know you should think of decide on your core values and let that guide you whenever you find yourself at a career crop crossroads when you think whether you want to dive deeper or you want to expand laterally um so moving forward um i wanted to touch on a little bit about what are the top trends that i see uh, from my current role at, at at google cloud um so mainly some of the things that i see is um uh, there's a lot of research and there's a lot of work about ml modeling but currently there is and not just currently but since a few few years there has been a lot of um, importance given to okay there is a great model but how do you operationalize it how do you productionalize it how does that great model that gives you great accuracy or you know whatever your optimization metric is does it run into production can it scale does it decay what if it decays can you you know switch like retrain a model and you know bring on a new model so that your business is you know continuously increasing um the other is responsible ai uh, there is a lot of uh, you know good work ab- uh, around responsible ai and companies like real companies which put models into production are no longer looking at responsible ai just as as an afterthought or things that you know as a corporate social responsibility no it's integral to their strategy right now uh to build trustworthy ml solutions and third is uh you know till till a few years back we were still thinking okay there is analytics there is machine learning and there is business domain expertise but now the swim lanes for all these three things are are merging together now ml you can't you don't talk about analytics without talking about machine learning um so given these this trends especially the, like personally i'm very interested in uh, machine learning operations and what i've seen um, especially at um, google cloud um, but also with other companies that i work with uh, i've seen that operationalization of ml is a is a is one there are constantly moving pieces and it takes a village to you know put a model into production so who are the people that you need and you know these are people people with different skill set and different personalities that you need working together in a you know in an in a team or in a, in that organization to make a model work in production like right from start right from building that model to running it into production um next slide please so one one more thing uh, before i get into those roles uh, that ml so you know many times um, maybe you have this notion maybe maybe you don't but many times machine learning is thought of machine learning code the model uh, but you know that's just a part of it what actually happens is there's a lot more things that that go on beyond a model so 